Hi, if anybody can um, is having trouble hearing me, let me know in the uh, questions window. Gonna wait a few more minutes. Thanks, guys, for the sound check. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to share my screen. All right. Well, thank you for um, signing up for my webinar. This is a 60 minute blitz on causal machine learning. And, and um, this is a webinar intended for people who are largely in the machine learning community or working on machine learning problems or are interested in machine learning problems and the role that causality has to play. And if you have been at machine learning conferences recently, you will notice that causality is kind of having a moment. Um, uh, recently, um, we had two very popular books on machine learning um, that ad address causality either directly or indirectly. And um, Judea Pearl talks about a robot that he wants to understand that you should not vacuum the room in the morning because it is uh, not because of some hard rule, but because vacuuming has woken that person up and that. The intention to vacuum is fine, but rather the circumstances of the vacuuming are not fine. So this requires a model that uh, understands intention. And he argues that this requires counterfactual reasoning, which is a causal concept. Uh, similarly, similarly, um, and again, I'm getting some weird feedback here. Okay. So similarly, we um, in Gary Marcus's uh, recent book, he argues that um, we need to move beyond just detecting statistical patterns and data sets and um, start focusing on building systems that can grasp three basic concepts, time, space, and causality. Um, Yasha Bengio, um, a luminary in deep learning, uh, has recently said in talks that uh, he wants, uh, that he said once a machine can understand the causal structure of the world, and, pro and produce plans to take advantage of the fact that they are not passive in the environment and can, and be, can be active and acquire knowledge, uh, we will be getting to a better standard of application. So he's talking about agent models there, but in his recent keynote at NeurIPS, he also talks about causality in the terms of hierarchical, uh, high level um, abstractions in, in, in neural network models. So being able to have those things be um, causal in nature and, and be composable and so that you can transfer them across problems. Um, we're seeing an increasing number of causal inference publications uh, and uh, workshops, tutorials. Um, these, this, is a, this image here is a panel um, at NeurIPS 2018 of several um, luminaries in causal inference. Um, but it also, causal inference has a strong role to play in the the ongoing debate about algorithmic bias and AI fairness. So, I'm going to tell you about what I'm going to 
cover in this talk. Um, one second here, let me pull this aside. Okay. So the first question is, what is a causal model and, and what can it do that deep learning in its basic form can't do? Um, secondly, you know, the big tech companies who we expect to be doing a lot of important things in machine learning, what are they doing in terms of causality? Uh, next, you know, how can you uh, learn causal modeling by building on your existing machine learning skill set? So rather than having to go learn a whole new domain of statistical and social science, can you can you work with what you already know and, and build from there? Uh, next, I'm going to talk about some of the best libraries uh, and to get started. So these are libraries in R and Python. Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about a new project I'm working on called Alt Deep School of AI and how you can go deeper on causal modeling and causal inference in machine learning. So starting off, what is a causal model and what can it do that machine learning can't do? To understand this, the, the difference here, we need to kind of understand three concepts, association, intervention, and counterfactuals. So association is going to ask a question like, you know, given X, what is Y likely to be? So a concrete example, given somebody on an exercise regime, what BMI are they likely to have? So this is the kind of question where models, um, particularly deep learning, will excel at, especially uh, in the case of deep learning, uh, assuming you have enough data, um, it can answer this question even when the relationship between X and Y is nonlinear and high dimensional. Um, but things start to get a bit tricky when we move into the area of intervention. So this is to say that if we force X to some value, how would that affect Y? So again, if we were to force somebody to start an exercise re regime, say like in a clinical trial, what would be the effect on BMI? This is different from just observing whether or not uh, somebody is exercising and seeing what their BMI is. Um, so this can break models like standard uh, deep learning because what it's doing is that it's changing the data generating function it's changing the probability distribution from what it was in the training data to what it is doing now to generate new data. Um, so to, to, to make that work, you, to, to predict an outcome under intervention, is going to require um, a representation of cause and effect relationships. And finally, uh, we have the counterfactual. So, Counterfactual in English, you would say something like, given X and Y, what would Y have been if X had been different? So this is something that we reason about all the time. Like, had I tried better in school, I would have gotten a better job. This is conditional on your situation now. You're making comparison between what you're experiencing and what you think you would have experienced. And to actually simulate what you would have experienced in your mind, you need a causal model of the world. So with this BMI case is saying, you know, all else being equal, what would my BMI have been if I had started that exercise regime? So this requires not just a representation of cause effect relationships, but some way of holding all these other things equal. So when I'm reasoning about how exercise would have affected my BMI, I'm assuming that everything that is not caused by exercise would have stayed the same in this parallel universe so that you know any kind of um, <clears throat> uh, problems that happened at work or any kind of uh, car accidents that i had on the way like unless my reaction to those situations might have been different because maybe i'm healthier and i can you know i have faster reaction times but um uh, they they still would have happened if they already happened in the world that i experienced that's how counterfactuals work so as we can think about these in terms of um, computer, computer vision. So if I were to get some um, training data and you know, train and get images with, uh, with the label boxer and say I condition on a, the label being boxer, and I want to say, okay, what elements of the image you know, in terms of high-level combinations of pixels are we likely to see? 
And so I could sample from this distribution, this conditional distribution, and I'd see, you know, pictures like this guy training, this other guy getting hit in the face, um, this other guy kind of posing for the camera. Now, an intervention would say like, all right, well, I want to set the gender for female. Now, I want to emphasize here, this is not the same as filtering or conditioning on gender, because what conditioning would do, what filtering would do is just that all the elements that tend to go with uh, female pictures vary as usual. So like if female pictures, if, 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 if pictures of female boxers tend to have, you know, more makeup or they tend to have, um, or they tend to be in more, say, glamorous locations, or they tend to be in boxing gyms as opposed to boxing um, arenas. I don't know. Um, so long as those things are not caused by the gender of the of the subject, those things will those things will be correlated with whatever gender, um, whatever the correlation, will, the, the correlation that you see in the training data between those elements and gender will remain if you just condition. So in an intervention, we expect everything that is not, um, uh, everything that is not um, downstream of gender to essentially stay the same. So just to kind of give an example here that in this training, you know, we still have a woman here training. We still have a woman here kind of being bloodied. We still have a woman here being posing. These things, these elements, since they have nothing particularly to do with gender, would not change in this new interventional distribution. And then finally, we have the counterfactual. So in this case, we would take the image of an individual boxer and we'd ask a very specific question, say, for example, what would this image look like if we changed her ethnicity to, to Asian? And so everything else stays the same. And just the things that are downstream of that, of the, of that ethnicity abstraction would change. In this case, you know, some of the features of the face. So the, the logical question is, like, can deep learning do this? And the answer is actually yes. You can try to use deep learning approaches to learn these interventional uh, and counterfactual distributions um, by specially curating the data and using some special training uh, procedures. So we, we know we have deep fakes and deep fakes works. So deep fakes are actually essentially counterfactuals. Like what would this video look like if it, instead of Obama talking, it were Putin talking? Um, However, what you would have to do to get that to work in deep learning is to explicitly plan your case study, your use cases in advance. Like I want to make this, the face of the subject in the middle of this frame who's moving in a certain way change to match the face of that subject. Um, and it would take a great deal of effort and to train and uh, for those specific use cases. A truly causal model would handle any use case you could throw at it so long as um, those those causal variables in the model are modeled explicitly. Um, and it would also require far less uh, data to train and would be less glitchy. Um, and most importantly, probably that these, these components that you train in this model will be transferable across domains because they're, they're, they have learned some kind of causal mechanism in the world, not just artifacts in the data. So why are it, so those are kind of, you know, toy examples, um, you know, Generating images is fun, but you know most of the time in machine learning, we're actually trying to predict something and make decisions based on those predictions. So I'm gonna to argue to you now that interventions are actually quite critical in ML-driven decision-making. So here's an example where, let's say that I have a training set um, where you know each morning I get data from a barometer and I, and um, and I and I and then I and I record whether or not it was sunny that day, or whether or not it rained that day. Now the barometer data is my features. The the weather at the end of the, in the middle of the day is um, my is my prediction target. So once I have the enough training data, I train a model that's going to predict what, given the barometer readings in the morning, what the weather is going to be later in the day. But then based on that, I I make a decision to carry an umbrella or not. So in this first case, uh, here I, I think my mouse to show up. In this first case here, I 
decide, I, might, I, I predict that I don't need an umbrella. So I don't bring it and that's right. In the second case, I, I bring it and I'm, and again, that's right. Third case, I don't bring it and I'm wrong, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm making decisions, sometimes they're right, sometimes they're wrong based on my predictive model. Now, the interesting thing here is that whether or not I carry an umbrella, it has no impact on the weather. The, the weather, the sky does not care about what I do with my umbrella. So when I collect training block two, I have more training data, I can just retrain my algorithm and increase prediction accuracy. Now let's use a similar example um, from business. So based on some business reporting, I'm going to predict whether or not my business is going to make money or lose money in that month or in that quarter. Um, so I collect this training data and then finally, I train a model, I, I put it into production, and then, but I start making decisions based on this model. So in, in, uh, th in, so in this first case here, I predict uh, that I'm going to make money this quarter, so I don't run an ad, and that was right. Uh, in the second, uh, second case, I predict that I'm going to uh, lose money this quarter, so I run an ad, because I want the ad to come and, and fix it. I want to make money. Um, in the third case, again, I, I, I predict that um, uh, I, make a, I, I make a prediction. Um, I, I don't run an ad and I'm wrong. Uh, my, uh, the uh, cost actually, um, my, I actually lost money that quarter. So that was a bad decision. Now, the issue here is that whether or not I run the ad impacts my revenue in the next period, in, in the next month, in the next, or in the next quarter. So I'm creating, so training block two is going to be different from training block one because now the, 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 there's a feedback effect. The, the decisions that I'm making about whether or not to run an ad or not, that is impacting the data that comes in the next um, period. It's feeding back into the system and it's, and it's essentially biasing my data set. And so that when I train this, if I want to combine these two uh, things together, again, I have one data set where I have... I have one block of the, of the training data where I have, I didn't run any ads, and then I have another block of the training data where I did. Um, now, a causal model can, can cure this by modeling the intervention. So the, running the advertisement is the intervention. And so if it has an intervention model, then it can understand what the, it, it, can, it can adjust for the effect of the intervention on the underlying uh, data generating distribution. Pause here and make sure. I'm going to wait till the end to answer questions, but I'm just going to click on something to make sure. Great. All right. Um, counterfactual uh, modeling is also useful for agents who are making decisions under uncertainty. So I'm talking about bandits, Markov decision processes, reinforcement learning. And so what we want to happen with these agents is that we want them to reason counterfactually about um, we want well, we want to reason we want to reason counterfactually about their performance in production. So I so I, I have my agent that's making decisions on my website, for example. I look at the logs and I say like, okay, here's what the agent did, and here's the response it got. Here's the reward, right? And it's making decisions based on this policy. Now, based on what if, what would, given this data, can I reason about how well this, how well this agent would have done if a different policy had been in place instead of the policy that is in place? Now, of course, I can just put a new policy in place and then run an A-B test, but that would be expensive. And oftentimes, if you, uh, if you can just reason counterfactually about the system without actually running the experiment and, and accruing cost, you, you can get some cost savings. But moreover, we want the agent to actually reason counterfactually about its own actions. So I'm the agent and I'm making decisions. I'm gonna say I'm a, I'm a bandit algorithm and uh, some input comes in and I did what I thought was best given what I knew at the time. Um, but given what I know now, I believe I would have gotten more reward had I done action A instead of B. So what I'm gonna do is update my policy so I don't make that mistake again, assuming that I encounter the same circumstances.
Um, okay, so what are the big tech companies doing about causality? So this is a logical question because you know, we expect big tech firms like Google and Facebook to be at the cutting edge of machine learning. Are they also at the cutting, cutting edge of causal inference? Um, the answer is that, well, yes, they are. Um, but in practice, there's actually relatively little, of course, it depends on your organization, but there's relatively little interaction between the teams that work on machine learning algorithms and, and implementing them and scaling them and the teams that work on causal inference problems. And to understand why, let's, let's first see what it takes to actually build a causal reasoning engine. So what I'm presenting here, it could actually be implemented as software. Um, this, you could code this up, this could be part of your experimentation platform. But if you're just you know, doing this by you know, an R script or you're doing it um, you know, in pen and paper, you're essentially using a similar workflow, which is to say you start with a causal model. This involves some assumptions of the, about the causal relationships between the variables in your system and then some parameters that parameterize those relationships. Once you have that, um, you have this inference engine. So this inference engine takes in two things, it takes in some data and it takes in a query. And the query is you know, a causal question that we want to know. The first thing we have to do is, is, is check if whether or not this query is identifiable given the data. Um, this is a identifiability is, is a concept from concept from theoretical statistics. Oftentimes statisticians will encounter there's something that they want to estimate, some parameter, and they have to reason about whether or not a data set they have on hand is actually sufficient to identify, to is it even possible mathematically to estimate the thing they're interested in? Um, and not in, in a causal model. You know, not all the causal queries that you want, you might want to have answers could be identified from the data that you have available. This is especially common in the tech setting where you have a lot of data coming in, but you might not have explicit control over, you know, what variables in, those, in that data are actually captured. And this is something that I found actually is, a, is surprising to many people who have kind of a pure training in uh, machine learning because they tend, they, they, this is a problem where more data doesn't help. It's, again, mathematically impossible. Tuning the loss function or coming up with more clever uh, training procedure, coming up with a more clever arch uh, architecture won't solve this. Um, and so it requires kind of grokking that and, 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 and you know, accounting for it in your, in your procedure. Um, so assuming that we can identify it, then we're going to find an S demand. An S demand is some statistical entity that if we estimate it, the, whatever number we get will answer the query. Um, and, and so this is again a function of you know, the data we have. Like, okay, given this data we have, what can we estimate and that will actually give us an answer? And then finally, we have an estimator. So this is the actual estimation of the estimand. And so this is the actual implementation of the statistical method. Um, so all the usual caveats apply, like variance versus bias, um, does it scale, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the, and so at the end of that, we get an output. So um, you've, if you've ex looked at causal inference before, you're probably familiar with a directed acyclic graph. It's just the most straightforward way of thinking about uh, causality. The nodes represent components in the system and the edges uh, correspond to a causal relationship. So an, an edge between from X to Y means that X is the cause of Y. And this rain sprinkler exam uh, grass example is a canonical example where um, rain causes the sprinkler to automatically turn on or turn off, um, turns off if there's rain. Um, and then both of these things cause the grass to get wet. So data scientists in industry who are working on causal problems, they're typically trying to estimate uh, a causal effect. So a causal effect is a quantification of the magnitude of impact a cause has on an effect. So this is usually quantified in terms of how the effect changes given a change in the value of the cause. 
while controlling for other va variables in the system, and these variables being called confounders. Um, so this, you know, you can think of this like a derivative, like given the change in um, given the change in x, how much does r change with z being held equal, being held constant? Um, now, so now we're talking derivatives, but you know, the, the simplest example is when we when the cost has two levels, so um, as in like a treatment and a control. And so it's typically the difference in predicted values of the effect between both levels of the cause after controlling for confounders. That's a causal effect. So what does this mean in practice? So if you're a Netflix user, you might have logged in recently and in that very top part of your dashboard, you might have seen a trailer for a sword and sorcerer um, series called The Witcher. It's based on a series of popular video games. Um, that What you see in that upper part of the upper portion of the dashboard. In fact, everything you see in the dashboard is either typically part of a test or is being optimized um, um, by some algorithm for you, uh, personalized to you. Um, and the tests themselves, they're trying to get at causal effects. They're trying to say like, for example, for this group of users, um, what is the effect of playing the Witcher trailer on that, on those users actually going on to view the series? Um, and you might think like, oh, well, this is this is easy. Just use an A/B test, right? So let's do that. We just take a random assignment and we take a group of people and we we randomly assign them to you know trailer watchers and some kind of control trailer. Um, but the issue here is this can't account for, and this is just one of the issues that they have to deal with. But they just, this can't account for events that happen after that randomization events that are typically out of control and that are not observed by Netflix. So for example, um, after you see that trailer, you might go on and see The Witcher on your social media feed. And that might, uh, you know, your social media feed, you know, you talk to your friends, this might lead to one of your friends recommending or not recommending you watch The Witcher. Um, based on what you've seen and what you and what people are recommending, this might prompt you to read a review article about the show or not. Um, all of these things affect, in addition to the trailer itself, affect whether or not you watch, you, you watch it. So all this pink area here, these this is all the sources of statistical association between watching the trailer and whether or not you actually watch the show. And so, but what the what these data scientists are actually interested in is this blue area, like what this is the, the part of the statistical association that that is following this lower arrow here, this lower path, this lower causal path between the trailer itself, the direct effect of the direct causal effect of watching the trailer on watching the show. And so to accomplish this, um, data scientists and at Netflix will use some special experimentation techniques that will make these causal effects identifiable. And assuming they can be identified, um, they'll come up with some estimation methods that will minimize, hopefully, bias and, and variance and also scale to the large amount of users that Netflix has to work with. Um, you know, so for this reason, these data scientists tend to be on teams dedicated to experimentation, um, as opposed to teams that are building and, and productionizing machine learning algorithms. Okay, so how can I learn causal modeling by building on my existing machine learning skill set? So I'm going to make the argument that you should do this by building from a generative machine learning outlook, assuming that you have some experience with um, probabilis probabilistic generative machine learning models. So let's go back to this causal reasoning engine and talk about DAGs again. So like actually in the causal inference community, there's a lot of controversy about whether or not you should be ca doing causal inference with a DAG. So if you've heard about um, Judea Pearl's approach versus, um, you know, this, uh, Pearl's and Spirite's approach versus um, people like um, um, Miguel Hernan or Herbin Rubin, um, people who, uh, you know, who, are, who call themselves uh, the potential outcome framework um, researchers. Um, now, and they, this, is t this tends to be the point where they have um, a lot of contention. Now, most agree that causal DAGs are at least very useful as communication devices. So you want to show kind of your assumptions about 
causality in the system, nothing's easier than drawing lines between nodes. Um, now, of course, some people prefer to use them directly in their causal reasoning engine, and this is where the contention lies. Um, um, people who don't like doing this, they don't like doing it because they don't know if the DAG is right. It's, it's very, these are very strong assumptions that this causes that, and you're just drawing these pictures and you have no way of validating it. This makes people uncomfortable. Um, but the proponents of this approach argue that, well, you're simply making your implicit causal assumptions explicit in the form of a DAG. Um, but putting aside that debate, I want to argue here that like, if you're a machine learning expert, you are perfectly happy using the wrong model, using the wrong DAG, you know, so long as it's useful. So, you know, we frequently work with latent variable models, such as mixture models, matrix factorization, hidden Markov models. And these, these are actually just fancy DAGs. Um, um, we often write these as plate models, which are just DAGs where you have these squares that represent the dimensionality of the node. Um, and they're implicitly causal because you're typically talking about a data generative process and you, you have an, an ordering to that story uh, about how the data, data is generated that reflects a, an implicit causal assumption. Um, you know, the, the labels cause the data, for example. So like, uh, um, and we don't, we're not, we, we don't actually believe that this is the true causal model. We don't believe that when we use a topic model to represent a document that's, that the topics are the only thing that's going into that document. We don't, when we use a hidden Markov model to represent a continuous process, we don't think that there's nothing else going on. We're just using the hidden Markov model because it's, it's, a, it's a simple yet useful model. Um, and we have a way of iterating on these models based on how well they actually perform. Um, so this is a flow chart uh, that David Bly came up with in a paper called Build, Compute, Critique, and Repeat, Data Analysis of Latent Variable Models, where you start with building a model, you do some inference, and then you criticize the model. So you do cross-validation, you do uh, goodness of fit tests, you do uh, uh, posterior predictive checks. Um, and if it works well, then great. And, you know, if there is a lot of, if there's problems with, that performance on those tasks, then you go back and you revise the model. Well, it turns out that the, interven the intervention based, um, the interventions, uh, the, well, the fact that a causal model allows you to do an intervention, it makes critiquing the critique part of that flow um, all, all, the, all the way here on the right, a lot more, well, it leads you to make much, much more robust models. And, and that's the reason because a causal model can makes, will make a prediction about what happens when you do an intervention. That, that's just a prediction. You can actually then go and actually do that intervention, say for example, run an experiment. And if that intervention prediction, if your prediction of the intervention and the actual, and the actual outcome don't match, you've falsified your model. So this is like core, core Karl Popper philosophy of science. You've, you said your model was gonna, that you said that according to your model that this, this cause effect relationship was true. You, you ran an experiment and it's false, your model is wrong. Um, so what you can do now is go back and uh, using this kind of falsification technique, go back and update your model and try to get it right. This is a lot, this is a lot stronger, a lot more bold a way of iterating on a model than just looking at what, you know, it's kind of predictive performance, it's cross-validation. Uh, because, you know, as Popper said, like, no matter how much evidence that you have that your model is a good fit, can't really prove that it's it's true, but you can you can prove you can refute this model as false, um, you know. And I like to bring up this example of George Soros, who's a you know a billionaire financier. He's also Karl Popper's. He was Karl Popper's student at London School of Economics, and you know his he attributes his his wealth to being able to come up with a model for you know how currencies move, and then getting some evidence and then refuting a model and immediately coming up with a new one. This is an industry where people tend to be very attached to their models, even when the, the empirical evidence is running not in their favor. Um, and also these latent variable models, they're a gateway to incorporating deep learning into causal reasoning. So um, number one, the uh, multivariate nature of, the, of these models. Uh, make them suitable for impl uh, implementation using a tensor library. Um, variational autoencoders, which um, use a neural network architecture in both the decoder and the encoder, 
are examples of deep latent variable models. Uh, and you know, deep nets uh, can be used to map the non-linearity between uh, a parent and the parameter of the child. And this can be very useful in some settings. Um, and then, but when you actually train these models, you can use some of the conditional independence uh, assumptions that, like, that causality um, uh, dictates, something like things like you might have heard before, like independence of mechanism, um, uh, that, that the different parent-child relationships are, within the graph are kind of separate independent modules. You can use those as constraints in your training procedure. So if we go back and look at like what it means to build a generative model, a, pro you know, a probabilistic reasoning engine, it actually looks a lot like our causal model. Um, the only difference from what we saw before is rather than, we've, than assumptions, we have a stronger model that can generate data. So our generative model here could be a Bayesian network, a latent variable model, a Bayesian non-parametric model, um, a probabilistic program, um, just as long as it can generate. And generally in these models, we don't really care about the weights, just like in most of machine learning, we just want to train them so that they can predict well. Um, the query is usually the prediction or expectation of a variable in the system or of some loss function. Um, and then um, we don't really care about identifi identifiability as much because again, we are just, you know, we wouldn't, if we couldn't predict we didn't have the data sufficient to predict some outcome that we're interested in is kind of a non-starter. So this tends not to be an issue. Um, and, you know, instead of say, you know, thinking about statistical estimation, we're actually probably more, uh, you know, thinking about kind of inference algorithms, say, you know, stochastic variational inference, um, you know, a Gibbs sampler, um, a message passing, something like that. So it's actually straightforward to implement causal models as generative machine learning models. And so, you know, we have causal Bayesian networks, um, which is kind of Perl's initial substrate for modeling causality. Um, but it extends to other directed um, generative machine learning models. Um, in these models, the parameter, we have to think a little bit harder about training the parameters because they are, again, representing some kind of causal mechanism between variables. And so we don't want to be, um, flipping and how we estimate them because we want them to transfer across domains. Um, again, the, the query can be a prediction or expectation of a loss function, or it can be um, a causal effect uh, as we did before. And, um, so, and so now if we're looking at causal effects or other kinds of causal queries, um, we have to think about identifiability and, and the estimate. And, and, but, we, we, but now we can kind of bring in um, cutting edge inference procedures, again, stochastic variational inference will make use of um, the various optimization frameworks that we have in um, deep learning uh, frameworks. Um, so starting with causal Bayesian net, like, as I mentioned, this is simply just a DAG and the parameters are parameterizing the conditional probability distribution. So if we want to generate from this model, we just sample from these distributions. But we can go beyond the DAG with um, probabilistic programming. So the way to think about, if you haven't heard about probabilistic programming before, the way to think about it is as a way of making Bayesian, uh, Bayesian network, networks Turing complete. So if, if Bayesian networks are, are causal models, or if Bayesian networks can be used as causal models, you just have a DAG that corresponds to causality and you still have the parameters then you can use a probabilistic programming language to represent that causal Bayes net because a, a probabilistic programming language is always expressive enough to represent a Bayes net. So the question becomes like, what happens when you relax that formalism? What, what additional causal semantics can you extract from, from a Turing complete high, um, or, um, or from, a, from a Turing machine? So, you know, a high level programming language, what, what extra things can I say about causality? Um, so one thing you can do, these are just examples, is that you can get pretty rich mechanistic simulations, you know, using con control flow. So Bayesian networks are very declarative. They're just like, this causes that, and given this, and that becomes that. But a, a, a your simulation can be very imperative. So like, you know, well, if this happens and that happens, and um, for all of the, you know, loop over this thing and then iterate on that thing, 
um, you know, this, you know, this, this starts to look a lot like some uh, physics models that you might, or, or physics models that you might model with like a differential equation. Um, you can also have agents make decisions based on future interventions they might make uh, using recursion. So I'm an agent and I'm thinking about what decision to make. And so I'm thinking about what's going to happen to me in the future and what decisions I'll make in future states. So when you have that kind of self-referential um, uh, approach, you know, often a smart thing to do is just uh, is, is to use recursion, um, something you couldn't do in a, in a, with a DAG. Uh, and finally, uh, a DAG has a fixed number of variables, but in a, pro, in a probabilistic program, you can make those the number of variables uh, random. And this, will allow, this can allow you to ask uh, to make even more interesting counterfactual statements, like say, for example, you know, 10 missiles were fired and our radar detected them all. We shut them all down. But, you know, had there been more than 20 missiles, we would have missed at least one of them. You know, so you can, you can, assi you can uh, assign a probability to that logical statement. Um, and finally, you know, when we start talking about programming, then we can move towards a kind of causal hierarchy. Part of the problem when why causal, causal modeling has had trouble taking root in machine learning is because in machine learning, we're often um, working with very low level features where it doesn't make sense to reason about them causally. Like, does this pixel cause that pixel? Or is this, do these two words, does one word cause the next word in the, in the utterance? Um, uh, but typically, these systems, we often think of them of, ha of having high-level abstractions. There's a technique, a technique called analysis by synthesis um, that, that's you know, been cha championed a lot in the probabilistic programming community, uh, where what you do is you kind of create a grammar of high-level concepts. You generate using that grammar, and then you use a neural network um, architecture to make the, the, the generative part of your model uh, more tuned to actual real-world examples. Um, there's no reason why this high-level probabilistic grammar shouldn't be a causal grammar. Finally, I'll talk a little bit about the, um, the best libraries to get started with. Um, but first, let me escape a little bit here, make sure I don't have any issues or questions. Okay, just hearing some comments, great. Um, all right, so... Um, do Y is a Python library by a friend of mine named Amit Sharma. He works at Microsoft Research. Um, so this is focused primarily on the on the problem of identification and estimation of causal effects, and it's um, it's it's really exciting. It's and it, you know I think if you're if you're working on a Facebook or a Netflix and you're not using this, you should start. Um, um, and so you know it, it, it it'll tell you if a causal effect is identifiable, and but in given that it is identifiable, it'll give you a, a menu of estimates and estimation techniques to choose from. This is kind of what it, what it looks like. You specify the model. Um, it, shoot. You specify the model here. You got. Um, so you you say what the, the the treatment here is the cause. The outcome is the effect. You you give it a DAG. Um, if you don't give it a DAG, it'll just kind of assume. Um, you know. An, un, an uninformed DAG, um, uh, and some, some other uh, arguments, and we just, so here again, like so, v zero and y here are the is that's the causal effect that we want to estimate the cause the, the the effect of v zero on y, and we have all of these other sources of variation, and so what uh, do y will do is it'll give you several estimates, and so in this case it's giving you, it's using something called a instrumental variable uh, as a way to say control for, use certain variables in the system to control uh, away the um, confounding effects from the other uh, from the other confounders and um, allow you to estimate that causal effect. It has some other estimate. It tells you what the assumptions of those estimates are. It, this is, and this is, it says estimate too. There's actually, it gives you several choices here. And then realize estimate is the actual Tech, excuse me, the technique for estimating it. And then so that value here is the estimate of the causal effect. And I'll do that for several estimates. So for several estimates, and it'll give you kind of P values so that you, you can compare and see what, you know, which ones seem to be, um, several estimates for several estimates and you, you can compare them and see and, and, and reason about which ones make sense. 
Um, there's an R, so that, you know, do wise in Python, there's an R alternative, one called ggdag, which builds on another library called daggity. And you can do the same thing. You kind of specify a dag. And this one uh, will show you estimands, like you, I, you don't have to interpret this graph here, but it's telling you basically confounding variables. The, the top of those facets are confounding variables that you can control for to be able to est to identify those causal effects between, between X and Y. Um, so you have three different options here, um, but it doesn't tell you a, it doesn't give you a, an, a, a, an estimation technique. You know, and some of these variables might have more or less variance than other ones. They might have more, they might have higher dimension, which might make some easier to work with than others. Um, there is a core package in, so I promised you that you'd get some code here. And so I have two things for you. So one is there's a, there's a core package in R called BN Learn, and it allows you to um, you know, work with causal Bayesian networks as a generative causal model. Um, and it's, you know, it's good in the sense that if you're working with a Bayesian network, you can handle interventions and uh, assuming that you can estimate the parameters, you can handle causal effect estimation, no problem. Um, you can infer the values of latent uh, va uh, variables, although um, you know it requ it re it's relying on some. It's not using cutting edge inference algorithms, so it might slow down if you get really large data. Um, and you know it has DAG, and the DAG is easy to to to, to, uh, to reason about. Um, the downside is that it can't handle um, counterfactual reasoning. So a causal Bayesian network is not sufficient to reason uh, to do. Um, counterfactuals and, and then some people might disagree with that but it depends on how you define counterfactuals and I define counterfactuals in a very specific uh, way the way Perl defines them um, it can it can um, um, it cannot sorry this is a mistake it cannot handle uh, open world uh, settings it cannot handle control flow um, can I can I handle uh, so open open world meaning that uh, a, a random number of variables can I do things like recursion um, and it can't handle variables that are arrays or tensors um, so you know like it cannot take advantage of 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 some of all the tools we built built up around deep learning um, I also have a tutorial for you on Pyro um, which is a PyTorch based probabilistic programming language. Um, and uh, so you can do, and, and, and you know, it's since it's based on PyTorch, you can do. Um, it has the kind of the uh, inference algorithms and the modeling capabilities you'd expect of a deep learning framework. It has the ability to again handle interventions, causal effect estimation. Um, it can handle cause uh, counterfactuals if you if you code your model in a certain way. Um, it can infer the values of latent variables in your model. Um, and it can incorporate uh, deep learning architecture and um, stochastic variation um, techniques. And um, it can also work with open world settings and we have, use control flow, although it can get kind of hinky if you try that. Um, it's not as easy, if, you're not, if you don't have a closed number of variables, if you are using control flow, it's kind of harder to reason about. Um, and you know, it's, it's Tough to debug. It's hard to get inference to work in these models in general, and that's an you know that's an ongoing problem of generative machine learning. It's not specific to causal inference, but um, assuming that you can get your your model to uh, your inference algorithm to work, you're golden. So let's see here. If I mean, what I did here is so I'm sharing with the conference uh, attendees a repository on. Um, on GitHub, and let's see here. So uh, I have two. I have, so for both BN Learn and for Pyro, I have an introductory. I have an introductory kind of vignette, um, and then I have a you know a clear example of how you would do um, um, causal reasoning with these systems. So this is using a a system um, uh, where for this this. The variables here correspond to this is traffic, this is the size of the city, this is the occupation that somebody has, 
Um, you know, so it's a, it's a kind of easy causal system to, to reason about. Um, and here I show an example of how you find the causal effect of city size on car usage. Um, I then, so, so with Pyro, so also in this repo is a very, very comprehensive introduction to modeling and um, inference in Pyro. Um, and that's just kind of the, the case you're not familiar with, with Pyro and, and, and need to get started. But, um, but once you've done that, I, I, I show two things. Um, well, so there's one model in here for that uses that exact same model as the BN Learn model uh, that's uh, transportation in cities. Um, and so this is the exact same model and you get the exact same uh, inference results um, down here. But now you can kind of, you can compare uh, implementing the model in a, in, a, in a causal Bayesian network to implementing the model in a probabilistic program. Um, but once you've done that, you can dive into actual, a counterfactual example um, in Pyro. And this uses a, a toy example that I uh, got from um, uh, Jonas Peters and Bernard Shokov's book. Um, uh, it uses something called a structural causal model, but um, I emphasize here that, it does, that for this to work, it doesn't need to be a structural causal model. Um, you can use other models so long as it has a, same, it has a mechanism similar to a structural causal model of kind of keeping things being equal, uh, conditional on a, a counterfactual intervention. Um, and it uses a kind of very simple inference technique, but to get this to work in, much, in larger problems, you'd probably have to, you, have, you would have to spend a lot more time thinking about inference. But this, this essentially, um, repeats that example in the book using uh, uh, counterfactual reasoning. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm taking a glass of water. Okay. And finally, so I want to announce um, this is a project I've been working on for a while Alt Deep School of AI. So this is um, online. Was a school that has online courses for these types of uh, mental models and practices and best practices for um, applied machine learning for kind of implementing um, machine learning in production, and uh, really tries to pull out some of the cutting edge research areas and 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 cast them specifically in terms of application and productionizing these algorithms. So for People who are attending this webinar, I'm, um, so everybody who's who's starting with this um, online course, they're getting 30% off for being uh, beta customers, essentially. But um, uh, if you, for attending this webinar, you'll get an extra 10% off. You get 40% off. There's two courses that um, there's only two courses there now. Both of them are on causal modeling. One is this course called Refactored Thinking for Machine Learning and Causality, and so this is a lot. Look, it's like a broader it's an expansion of this slide deck. It's really staying high level. It's talking about um, model-based machine learning, how um, to incorporate causality in those models, some of the um, um, ways of building these models, how to um, reason using kind of Bayesian inference about these models, both in terms of the parameters that you're training as well as the, the inferences that you're making, say, for example, using Bayesian risk. Um, so this is really appropriate for people who just kind of want to understand how causal modeling fits into machine learning, uh, but without going into um, especially a lot of the math that comes in with identification and estimation. Um, so this, so this, this, there is a little bit of notation, especially in the Bayesian stuff, but it stays at a high level and it's very useful, for example, for people who are investors or running teams or, or AI product managers as well as actual pra um, practitioners, independent contributors. Uh, the sort of pro promo code here is promo code here is causal webinar eight. Um, oh, I'm going up, sorry. Uh, and then, so like the full, we also have a full track that um, is equivalent to it's a comprehensive course that's covering. Uh, it includes that uh, rethinking course. It goes into modeling of interventions. It goes into uh, uh, identification and estimation. It goes into counterfactual um, 
um, well, the, the algorithms behind counterfactual reasoning. Um, it's a it's a comprehensive um, um, course on causal modeling and machine learning, um, and it's taught in conjunction with a it's 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 derived from a graduate school course that I teach at Northeastern University. So it's it really is targeting people who are actually in, intending to go and implement these models. Um, again, so the um, the webinar, uh, the promo code here is causal webinar eight. So you can just visit altdeep.ai and check out those courses. And um, this 40% offer expires in 48 days, but I'm sure you guys are all jump on top of it. So uh, that's it. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to answer questions in this thing. How can I, all right, let me see. Hmm. All right, I'm just working with this GoToWebinar screen here. All right, so I'm glad you cited, so Jeremy Zucker asked, I want to work backwards. I, I, yeah, I'm glad you cited Jonas Peters and Bernard Shokoff. Um, did you read his recent paper on causality and machine learning? I thought it was much meatier than seven tools of causal inference with reflections on machine learning. Uh, yeah, that paper was kind of trippy. He, um, I think there was one section where he's talking about Bitcoin and how it represents like information transferring through society and, and then connecting it to thermodynamics. Um, um, but it was a fun read. I definitely, so I definitely, if, uh, I don't remember, I think it's just causality and machine learning or something like that. So Bernard Shokoff, um, it's a, it's a, it's not a very, it's not a, technical paper, so I do recommend people read that that paper. Um, the link to GitHub, I hope it's you can see it right here. So Robert Ness slash causal underscore ML underscore webinar. Uh, you do need structural causal models for counterfactual inference. Um, I encourage you to go, you can generalize beyond uh, structural causal models. You still need that, um, uh, that ability to say, have some exogenous variables that are not uh, connect that are you know that are where, where and all the other endogenous variables are directly downstream of them, but you don't they don't have to be um, say for example in a DAG. So um, the, I, I I recommend you Google to see that um, a friend of mine his name is Zena he just graduated from MIT he's got a probabilistic programming language in Julia called Omega um, and, and a sub and part of that is called Omega C where he demonstrates some counterfactual reasoning with um, uh, control flow and, and his his language is is specifically intended to be able to implement those Perl twin world counterfactuals but he's able to generalize the framework beyond structural causal models. All right, if it can't handle recursions, how does that affect natural language where there may be recursion on a word? Um, you know, I'm glad you asked. I work on, so I work at a startup named Gamalan that's, well, you know, we're a, an AI startup for natural language modeling. We use, you know, a, we use generative models. We use a probabilistic programming approach often. Um, and, you know, our models are very recursive. I've thought long and hard about how to, reason about these things causally, you know, one of the things that's in terms of actual pra practical application, you know, if you build like a, a voice bot that has some kind of targeted task, like answering a customer service query, then, you know, whether or not it answers that query is the reward. And then you can uh, train, um, you know, you, you can have it, you can have that agent and the questions that it asks the customer, to, the actions, the customers, the environment, you can train it with reinforcement learning. And then the policy that you can train, you can use counterfactual policy evaluation. But in terms of the actual language model, um, I so I mentioned an analysis by synthesis approach. I think now I've seen papers where people implement natural language by having kind of a high level concrete grammar. And then they, 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 they train, so for example, you know, they have there's one way of saying something in this grammar, and then they they um, train a generative model that maps to a whole bunch of ways of saying it in natural language. I think that if you wanted to reason causally, 
about natural language, then um, having a causal high, high, high level grammar would be the way to do that. Although I've never seen an implementation um, of something like that. Check out PyAgram, uh, which is a Python interface to a C++ implementation of PGMs that has been extended to causality, including counterfactual. So I have not heard of that. I will check it out. It's probably pretty fast, it sounds like. Um, I'm generating an identification algorithm for do I, but I need to add the simplification and pruning methods of SAN2, Tika, because estimates are currently blowing up. It is a work in progress. Um, I suggest you reach out to Amit directly. He's actually very responsive. So if I, and uh, so this will be the last question. I want to respect people's time, but it says, if I understand um, correctly, you're, you aren't relaxing the Bayesian network formalism. Uh, the computational graph is still a DAG, but it's a, it is a compression of a DAG of the, in the sense of Kolmogorov information, where instead of representing a DAG explicitly, you write a small program that can generate the graph. So that's one way of, um, of saying it. So you can say that the flow diagram of the program is corresponding to a DAG. Um, and so like, especially in a probabilistic setting, depending on how the trace of a program is executed, you know, you might, you know, basically you get several DAGs and, you know, you're kind of averaging your causal inferences across an entire set of, of, of DAGs that are realized as you repeatedly execute your program during, um, during inference. Um, that is, that's, that's definitely a, an adequate way of looking at it. I think there's, um, I think there's some investigation that needs to be done, doing it done in, term, in terms of like what, what are, for example, like this D separation work on those, on those, um, on, on those flow control, uh, those control flow diagrams, you know, or what, you know, what, what is, is there some kind of generalization of D separation or, or Markov, uh, or, or <clears throat> excuse me, faithfulness, causal faith, faithfulness, for example, in, in, um, um, a, you know, abstract syntax tree. I think there's there's some interesting research questions there. Okay, um, so we're at time. Um, thank you very much for um, um, joining my webinar. I enjoy. I, I encourage you to check out the uh, the repo and to check out all the School of AI, and then of course reach out to me on Twitter or um, by email if you have any other questions or you want to connect. Thank you.